Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Mike Bonin. We will make a quorum, but as we, uh, as uh, other members uh, begin to arrive, let's go ahead and start with um, multiple item comment cards uh, before we uh, hear all the items. And we're going to start that uh, with Arnold Sachs. Um, Arnold Sachs, you have one minute for general public comment and then two minutes for all of your items. Arnold Sachs will be followed by Peggy Lee Kennedy, followed by Allison Schallert. Yes, thank you. Good, good afternoon, Arnold Sachs. And I was going to try to uh, channel my inner concentration. I just couldn't get the name of the MC for the game, game show concentration. Hello? So item number one refers to allocating grant funding to whom? Because item number nine requests an amount of $450,000 for the same homeless housing, the same thing. You can match one with nine. Just look at the agenda. Item number two refers to an LP. What exactly is an LP other than a long playing record? And also this language, instead of the word of affordable housing, it should be for affordable housing. And why are you paying remediation costs? Item number three refers to bonds or notes. What would be the difference when you're doing the housing and you have multifamily versus single, well, you have multifamily conduit revenue bonds or notes. What would be the difference between multifamily and a single person conduit bonds or notes? Um, item four refers to you have a program or you're gonna create a pilot. Which is it? It's either or. Item five refers to your tax, your parking spaces. But it says you're looking for tax breaks. Don't you know? Didn't you find this out? Why isn't there a fi f fiscal impact statement? And that's number 10. Because in number 10, you're looking for storage areas. Are storage areas eligible for a tax break? Concentration it is. Pay attention here. Item six, um, permanent, how HHH permanent supportive housing loan. You know the county just authorized $500 million in cash to purchase a church. Item seven, don't that fall under the Affordable Care Act coverage? I mean, wraparound service including substance abuse assistance. Where is the Affordable Care Act money? Item eight. What about the county czar? We have a county czar that was appointed by the governor, Dr. Mark Ridley Thomas. Have you heard of him? What about his input? Item nine, well, we did nine and 10. <coughs> so that brings us to items 11, 12, and 13, which is like $14 million for bridge housing. And you just did, how much money did you today in for t uh, TIFIA funds or Whichever funds you had in city council today for all the units, 500 units, $150 million, $14 million for bridge housing. What is bridge housing? You could save money by using the underpasses. More underpasses, more homelessness. Great job. All right. Peggy Lee Kennedy will be followed by Allison Schallert, followed by Ben Casorla. Um. Hello, City Council people. Uh, I really wish there was some way that I could get you to steer a different way and not criminalize homeless people, not move them intentionally, not make them break down their tents for no reason when you don't clean up around the tents, not make them move out of a park to a sidewalk in front of somebody's house, and, and not tow them. You know, let's think of the lives that are affected here. So many of these people are sick and disabled. We should be focusing on saving their lives. You know, like not towing them. How about helping them figure out how their vehicle could get right so they don't get towed? And I really am, I take exception with LASA, although I don't like the people that criticize LASA because I believe services should come first. And if LASA is the leading uh, 
organization and services, then, you know, maybe they should get the boot off the old man's van that has the heart condition that's going to get towed if, if within 72 hours, if that boot doesn't come off. Maybe that LASA can help with that process and get them in the cap system. And instead, what LASA did was, oh, you don't want to go into this a shelter at the armory, or we can't help you see you later, and not even give them a CES number, because it takes a CES number to get on the cap. And then me, a, a person with no funding, paying to get the boot off after a city council person has to intervene with the Department of Transportation, I really think we should be steering in a way that saves lives. We need to look at it in terms of life is precious. My best friend in the world, my oldest friend in the world, almost died yesterday. You know, uh, she has kidney disease, and one of them came out. And anyway, since she got a blood clot, and she almost died. You know, and she told me that she was so proud of everything I do because she was in a homeless shelter and she didn't even tell me she was in a homeless shelter and she was so ashamed. You know, life is precious. We have to do what it takes to save lives. If three people a day are dying, we have to do whatever that is and not you know, oh, the park closes at 10.30, let's send the police and move those people onto the sidewalk, you know, which is further away from a toilet. Because the toilets are in the park. You know, there's so many homeless people that need to go to the bathroom. It's life or death out here, people, please. Thank you. Um, Allison Schallert will be followed by Ben Casorla, followed by um, Jose Ramos. And one minute for general public comment, one minute for item number seven. Okay. Hi. I'm Hi. Allison Schaller, and um, I'm glad to be here. Um, I, you know, I've been attending a lot of these meetings lately, and I am um, so grateful to be here because of this idea of repurposing the uh, St. Vincent uh, Medical Center, because I feel like I feel like this is a great attempt, a great uh, idea to think outside of the box, to, to create solutions right away. I really, you know, listening to this impassioned woman next to me, um, I, I, and then I was walking my dog this morning, and there was a construction site with a toilet and, on the street, and how great it would be if we could provide a little bit more sanitary conditions for people. Um, Chrysalis received money here last week to have a great program started in the neighborhood for uh, people uh, street, uh, cleaning the street and greeting people. You know, that's another way we can put people to work and give people money to, you know, eat, to call their loved ones, to whatever. I just think that this continued movement towards thinking outside of the box is the only way for solutions. I don't think that there's any time like the present then to stop um, listening to the naysayers. I am most disturbed, I'm absolutely most disturbed when you guys, and I say you guys, it, a couple of the people that aren't here today referred to Los Angeles residents separately than the unhoused. And I've been very upset by that lately because two of the council people were implying that unhoused people are not residents. And I find that sadder than anything. So good job. Stop listening to the naysayers and just keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I neglected to mention that we're joined by uh, our colleague David Rue. We have quorum. Um, uh, ben Casarol, uh, Casor, I'm sorry, Casorla. Nice try. <laughs> uh, ben Casorla, followed by Jose Ramos, followed by Joy McManus. Um, my name is Ben Casorla. Um, I'm a member of the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council and on the um, Homelessness Subcommittee and the Housing Subcommittee. Um, I am here to talk about item seven and, if I have a second, about um, the bridge housing agenda item, item 11. Uh, regarding item seven, um, in a world where to build uh, supportive housing costs upwards of $500,000 a unit, I think a structure such as St. Vincent, where we can house hundreds of people, 
and not have to do any kind of build out like that is an obvious win for the city. I know that the county is also interested in this. Whoever gets it, I'm glad for them. It's the county, it's the city. Either way, I think it's a great idea. And um, as regards number 11, um, the bridge housing on Riverside Drive in Silver Lake, I think that's also a fantastic idea. A lot of the homeless population in Silver Lake um, is on the river there, very close by, so it's very um, easily accessible for the population that's there. And I think that approving the money for that is an easy, very easy yes for this subcommittee. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, between the county and the city, we're exploring every possible way to acquire St. Vincent's. Some work has to be done first, but we're putting it out there, and uh, all partners and all interest is welcome because you're right. It's an absolute once-in-a-lifetime opportunity since it's pretty clear that it won't be operating as a hospital moving forward. We have a ready-built facility uh, for that need. So thank you. Thank Can you I ask comments. what something like the Silver Hill Lake Neighborhood Council or Westlake could do to be helpful in thank that you. manner? Is there anything? Uh, just the letters of support that we've gotten have, have helped already. So thank you for your okay. support. Thank you. Um, we have Jose Ramos, uh, one minute for general public comment, one minute for item number one, followed by Joy McManus, followed by Marilyn Wells, and we've been joined by our colleague Marquise harris Sir. Hello. Hello, my name is Jose Ramos, and um, I have reached out to many people, and especially District 7, the councilwoman, but she's never available, but yet she likes my vote, but right? But one of the things is that I'm actually, I had a heart attack two years ago, so I lost my job, and I became homeless with my family. We were set in a, in a shelter where we were abused, and my daughter, my 10-year-old daughter, ended up in a mental health um, facility hospital because she was abused in that shelter. The people in that shelter never did anything. We did grievance and, and reports and everything. Now they don't have any of those reports. They say that they lost them. They say that they're going to help them, but they never help us. So what I've decided is I filed a lawsuit against Los Angeles Family Housing, against Bridge to Home, and some of the people that work there because this is the only way that people are going to start listening to me and start seeing what we've gone through. Tomorrow, we have to get out of the motel and we have to pay for a, a room because the 28th day is over. So now, my daughter that suffers from mental health, the psychiatrist says that is not good for her health, but yet family housing doesn't do anything. We've been there for a year and a half. We go to work, we struggle a lot, but since nobody gives us any help, it is hard for us to, you know, with my um, heart disease that I have, it's hard for me to work full-time job. So this is one of the reasons why I just decided to come here. Maybe somebody would listen to me and hear me out and investigate why these people make false reports because they say that the only reason they could do those false reports is for them to keep getting more and more um, help from the people that they get the money from. Thank you. Thanks for sharing with us your, your difficulties, sir. Um, Joy McManus, followed by Marilyn Wells, followed by Sachin Med Medicar. Hello, I'm Joy McManus. Um, I wrote to you, Councilman Farrell, I wrote a letter in support of St. Vincent. Thank you. Um, I just want you to know I'm a homeowner in the Hancock Park area. I'm a member of St. James Episcopal Church. I volunteer at the soup kitchen there, and I'm also a volunteer with Marilyn and Allison's Stories from the Frontline. Everybody that I've come across um, that I've discussed this idea of refurbishing St. James is just thrilled about it. And, and hopefully, what did I say, St. James? St. Vincent. We knew what you meant. Um, you know, hopefully there will not be objections in the neighborhood because it's not like putting up an apartment building in the middle of someone's residential neighborhood. And it just seems like a no-brainer to me. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to use the rest of my time to mention, I went to a meeting last uh, last week in the evening. It was the Mayor's Homelessness Liaison Committee meeting for neighborhood council people. Oh, I'm an alternate on the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. So... Um, there was a nice presentation, and then there was a QA. and a And the Q&A, the only questions that I heard were regarding the care unit and the, the sweeps. And um, everybody was like, can't, why can't you post when and where these are going to happen other than just nailing a thing to, you know, a, a, a lamppost? 
why can't you put it online so people can be aware the same day that, this, that the cleanups are happening? Because a lot of the people that were there are part of neighborhood organizations that are trying to help their homeless neighbors, and they want to know about it so that they can go on site ahead of time and help people prepare and get their belongings together. And to be honest with you, I felt the response was pretty weak. It was like, well, it's too short notice, and just, you know, talk to your neighborhood deputy or whatever. But, I, I mean, the Internet, you know, <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> just, right. Every morning you know when they're going to happen, so please consider putting them online so people can go and look. Well, thanks for your suggestions, and thanks for your support for St. Vincent's, and thanks for your volunteerism, volunteerism to serve on the neighborhood council. I just want you to Thank know you. that there are a lot of people like me that feel mm -hmm. very strongly. Appreciate it very much. Um, Marilyn Wells will be followed by Sachin Medicar, followed by Zachary Awarma, and one minute for general and one minute for item seven. Um, I'm speaking out for item seven, uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, and I think it's a brilliant idea to refurbish the hospital uh, for housing and for services. The services piece is, is terrific. 366 beds, um, an easy renovation is wonderful, and I also don't see that there should be pushback from the neighborhood. Um, we have the, such a need for mental health, and if that could be a big part of the facility, especially because most of the mental health um, support is in prisons these days, um, it would be really great to have good support for, for this um, population of people. Um, <clears throat> Also, just want to support, we always go when there's support of housing that needs extra support, especially if there's pushback. Um, but we also want, really want to support low-income housing and would hope that, you know, so we could get to a place where every building um, requires low-income housing and not just getting out of it by paying a fee. We should just have as much low-income low housing if we're going to have, continue to have people falling into homelessness. Right. Um, every year faster than we can house them and we are doing a great job housing and I appreciate all the work that all of you guys do um, we need to get some housing for people that work in the city thank, thank you. you thank you so much um, uh, next we have um, Michelle Richards uh, followed by Sachin Medicar uh, followed by Zachary Warma and I and again one minute for general public comment one minute for item number seven Michelle Richards Michelle Richards, followed by Sachin Medicar. Hello. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm a homeowner. I live in Windsor Square, and I also work at Alexandria House, which provides safe and supportive housing for women and women with children. We have been in the Mid-Wilshire area for over 23 years. We boast a not over a 90% success rate in keeping people living in permanent housing. However, we are now being impacted with an eviction crisis. Our past residents who have been stable for 10 years are now finding themselves falling back into homelessness. When I drive by the empty lots in my neighborhood, it breaks my heart. When you see how quickly a new ride-sharing program can be set up at LAX, like that, it breaks my heart breaks my heart. I've been working at Alexander House for over 18 years. I'm very, very proud of the work that we've done, and I'm asking for all of you to do everything you can, everything you can, to stop luxury developments and more affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have Sachin Medicar, and I, m I might be pronouncing your name wrong, I apologize, um, uh, followed by Zachary Warma, followed by Alana Riemerman. Hi, yeah, uh, my name is Sachin, it's close. Uh, I am the Vice Chair of Echo Park Neighborhoods Council uh, in your uh, district, although obviously I'm here representing myself. Um, I'm also uh, a member of the SELA Neighborhood Homeless Coalition um, and just consider myself generally an advocate for those who are unhoused. Um, my general public comment is about uh, services for those who are uh, considered low acuity. Um, I want to actually thank you for the, the thing you wrote about that. Um, it's, it's really an important issue. I think uh, providing services for folks who are low acuity is extremely important. These are folks who are often <coughs> working, trying to support a family who just recently became unhoused, and these are folks that only need a little bit of help to get back on their feet. Um, it's really heartbreaking for me when I talk to someone who didn't score high enough on the CES and having to just be like, you know, hope, you know, if you get a disease in the next couple of months, maybe your score will go up and then you'll get some real help. Um, so that's something I'd really ask all of you to really focus on trying to provide more services for things like that. Um, 
And the, the other comment I'm giving is about uh, the tax related to safe parking. So safe parking is one of these actual great services that do provide essentially um, an opportunity for folks who are experiencing uh, homelessness but have a low acuity score. Um, they have an incredible rate of success. Um, the tax deduction proposal I think is great. I don't think it goes far enough. I think personally we, Echo Park Neighborhood Council unanimously passed the CIS asking for a tax on all parking lots unless they participate in safe parking. I know that there's a legal concern about whether you can give special like taxes on alike businesses, I guess is the concern. I'm, I'm not a lawyer personally. Uh, I would hope that that's not the case since almost any kind of business can have a parking lot. And so, you know, to say that the Dodgers are similar to a pharmacy, similar to, you know, any other business that's a parking lot, I hopefully that won't be found that way. So anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. And thanks for serving on a neighborhood council. I appreciate that. Um, all right, Zachary Warma, followed by Alana Riemerman, followed by Anne Molina. And Zachary Warma, uh, two minutes for items four and eight. Mr. Chair, council members, good afternoon. My name is Zachary Warma, and I'm the public policy specialist for the Downtown Women's Center. I come before you today to speak to docket item eight and the city's review of the comprehensive crisis response strategy authored by Governor Newsom's Council of Regional Homeless Advisors. <coughs> the comprehensive crisis response strategy is an exhaustive and multifaceted roadmap for how California can successfully combat homelessness along with the attendant crises of housing affordability and mental health accessibility. However, in the plan's 40 different policy and legislative prescriptions, there is not a single strategy that specifically addresses the unique needs of the more than 50,000 women currently experiencing homelessness in California, nor those of LGBTQIA Californians, unhoused Californians of color, immigrants and refugees, or Californians fleeing domestic or intimate partner violence. Just as with seniors, Rural Californians, those suffering from mental illness, key groups at the Comprehensive Crisis Response Strategy rightfully acknowledges a commitment to addressing a subpopulation opens doors to increased community will, resources, and visibility for the greater population. Thanks in part to the work of this committee, the City of Los Angeles has become a leader in identifying and working to address the specific needs of women experiencing homelessness. We urge that the committee and the council writ large when evaluating the comprehensive crisis response strategy to not lose sight of the specific needs of women experiencing homelessness and other vulnerable populations in our city and state. Uh, furthermore, uh, the DWC wishes to lend its full support and encouragement to docket item four of the senior, uh, the senior homeless prevention plan, uh, Brandy Orden, who we wish to congratulate for her 2020 Impact Makers Award to our Impact Makers to Watch Award, and the LA Aging Advocacy Coalition are doing critical work to advance the needs of older <coughs> Angelinos at risk of falling into homelessness. We also want to thank the committee for its continued leadership on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alana Riemerman will be followed by Anne Molina, followed by Brandy Horton, and uh, you're speaking on item four. One minute. Thanks. Thank you. And that was actually a perfect segue into my public comment. My name is Alana Riemerman. I'm a member of the LA Aging Advocacy Coalition, and we're actually one of the entities that helped with the report back that was developed by the Department of Aging and the Housing Department. So we just wanted to come here today to thank you for your focus on uh, vulnerable older adults and for moving this pilot forward. Um, and we also support you modeling the city's program after Santa Monica and Glendale's rental subsidy program. Um, and we look forward to continuing to help um, to actually help identify funding sources and program design considerations. Um, and thank you again, and we look forward to further collaboration. Thank you. Anne Molina, followed by Brandy Horton, followed by Cecilia Castillo. Item number uh, seven, one minute. Thank you so much. Thank you. I first just want to say thank you to everyone here, and thank you to everyone out here for all the work that you do, all the hours that you put in, and all the prayers that you say. Thank you so much. Um, we know that it's a tough job, and we appreciate all your efforts. I was homeless 25 years ago. For 20 years, I worked as a banker. Uh, up until recently, I had a heart condition, and now my five children and I are this close to homelessness again. I never thought that would happen. I thought that I was no longer homeless, but that housing insecure population is growing. Um, knowing that the St. Vincent de Paul is even a possibility made all of our hearts swell. It's exciting to know that we're thinking about different options. Um, I just want to say that I was in a shelter, I was in a group home, and I had a really great experience. They helped me transition out into independent living. 
And if it wasn't for all those programs, I wouldn't have made it. Thank you. Thank you for your very personal testimony because that tells the story and really uh, serves as, as the greatest motivation for all of us when you share your personal story. So thank you for that. I just want to share that my honor roll student daughter, who's 15 years old, ditched school to be here with you guys today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Cecilia Castillo, followed by Charlie Carnell, followed by David Galoob. Hi. Brandi Orton, Los Angeles Aging Advocacy Coalition and St. Barnabas Senior Services. Uh, Alana already gave you the recap of um, our intent to work on this motion, and we want to thank you very much for your leadership on this issue. Um, us and our fellow advocates stand ready to be at your side um, to support this motion and to work out the different program details and identify the funding streams. So um, thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, Cecilia Castillo. Oh. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Cecilia. Uh, so, uh, you, you're, are you speaking on behalf of? I'm speaking on behalf of Councilmember Bloomfield right. for item five. Yeah. Oh, for item five. Yeah. Go ahead, and, and you're not limited to one minute. So, yeah. Uh, so, council members, uh, the item before you is just to look at a report at possible incentives, whether they be tax or other sorts of incentives, to incentivize safe parking on private lots. Uh, we need to look at all existing options and also create new options. At this point, we would just like a report that provides whether or not tax incentives or other types of incentives are possible. Um, but there's no action other than getting a report at this time. And Councilmember Blumenfield uh, requests your support on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Charlie Carnow, uh, David Galoob, followed by uh, Gallo Medina. Hi, I'm Charlie Carno, and I'm with Unite Here Local 11. I want to thank all of you for uh, continuing to build the supportive and homeless housing that we need. But more people are falling into homelessness every day than, than, than the people we can house. And we, we, what we really need to do, in addition to building new housing, is to address the crisis of displacement. Our community plans, mm -hmm. and in particular the next one coming up, the Hollywood Community Plan, provides a great opportunity to do so. Stop the conversion of our rent-stabilized buildings, uh, to hotels and to larger buildings without replacing those units. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to look at the community plans as a way of addressing the crisis displacement. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, David Galoob will yeah. be followed by uh, Gallo Medina, will be followed by Gina Tarusambat. Sir. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Mm -hmm. I, my perspective here today is partly as a parent. In our blended family, there are 11 children. Although right now we only have, we have peace and quiet because there are only three living with us. Um, but hopefully my perspective is also that as a humane citizen who, who is aware of the needs and the problems of the homeless. So my point, my, my two points is if there were a fire, the residents of the building would be, would be uh, um, moved to a facility immediately, why can't there be more speed with regard to not only providing shelters for the homeless, but also for, for assistance with homeless who may be causing a problem? Um, I would just like to see more speed by the, the police and the city with regard to the needs of the homeless, which are legitimate. Thank you, sir. Um. Gallo Medina, followed by Gina Charasambat, followed by Jessica Paral. Good afternoon. My name is Gallo. I'm a business owner, commercial property owner on Hollywood Boulevard, born and raised native here. And I'm here on behalf of one of my tenants who has told me now that they're going out of business because of the homeless issues that they're having on Hollywood Boulevard. Seven people this time next week will be without a job. They will be here to show you and give you documentation that their customers, their clients are being accosted, their cars are being broken into when they park, nobody's coming to patronize the businesses, and once you know, I'm sure, when a business goes out of business, next door also has ramifications. It's a domino effect. Now, we are in a crisis, there's a dilemma, nobody disputes that. But there are some circumstances now that are also coming to light. Triple H was four years ago. We have some issues that are going on right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Gina uh, Chorosambat, followed by Jessica Peral, followed by uh, Juliet. Just one name listed, Juliet. Uh, general public comment. 
Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Gina Trusenbach from the Thai Community Development Center. Uh, displacement is a crisis that is pushing people into homelessness. While we recognize and applaud the projects to build bridge housing and PSH, particularly in, in council districts 4 and, and 13, we need to ensure that the that new developments include affordable units. And that's why um, it's so concerning that there, there aren't strong affordability standards in the proposed Hollywood Community Plan update. So we, we urge um, council members O'Farrell and Rue to do um, the right thing and make sure the Hollywood Community Plan uh, doesn't undermine our affordable housing programs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Parral, uh, followed by Juliet. Uh, is it Juliet Garcia? Yes. Is it the same person? Okay, yeah, I thought, I thought so. We were having a problem with no, that. No problem at all. Thanks. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Parral. I'm an advocate with the Los Angeles LGBT Center. As an organization whose fastest growing client base is uh, LGBT seniors, we strongly support the senior prevention program. Uh, we've watched Santa Monica's success with a similar program with great interest and couldn't be more elated that the city of Los Angeles is now ready to provide this life-saving assistance to our seniors. Uh, we stand ready to uh, work on the, with the council on this program going forward, and thank you for your work on this important project. And thank you for your work at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Thank you. Um, uh, Julia Garcia will be followed by, I think, uh, Nina Suarez, followed by Noel Weiss. Good afternoon. I'm not here from any group. I am just a citizen. I am just a person who was born and raised in Los Angeles, particularly in Silver Lake, in Councilman O'Farrell's district, and he's been tireless, well, him and his task, staff, about getting things handled as much as possible in our area with the homeless and with the situation and getting them off the street and trying to get them help. However, there is a whole different entity, the home free, the people who do not want to get off the street, the ones that are dealing drugs and stealing our bicycles and making a mess out of our lives. My son used to be able to walk to his grandparents' house, which is five blocks away. He can no longer do that because now there are tents and trash and drugs, and urine, and feces. And it's just out of control. We need help. Please, please help clean our streets up. That's all we need. Please. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks Juliet. Good to see you. Uh, Nina Suarez, followed by Noel Weiss, will be followed by Peter Meza. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Nina Suarez. I'm with East Hollywood Neighborhood Council. Every neighborhood council that has submitted a comment on the Hollywood plan supports the Just Hollywood plan, which will help fight against homelessness by pushing back against displacement. The loss of rent controlled apartments to fancier apartments without appropriate replacements or conversions to other uses like hotels is eating away at our housing stock, but can we stop it? I'm oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> but can we stop it with a smart community plan? We urge Councilmember O'Farrell to vocally support this plan. Just in East Hollywood, we lost 108 rent-controlled units. That's the second highest in the city, and I urge not just Councilman O'Farrell, but all the other council members to support this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Noel Weiss, followed by Peter Meza, and then Rohan Abekit. I'm here just, I signed up just for item 12. Uh, that's what I have, yes. Okay, good. One minute. Oh, okay, so I just have one minute yeah. for item 12? Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the Griffith Park Bridge Shelter Project. Uh, my comment in one minute, I guess next time I'll do multi-task. Um, this, the people need to know, this is, the, the matter on calendar is a six million, or a 5.5 million dollar appropriation, but the city is not putting dollar one into this. The people should know. They haven't put dollar one into, I don't know about the other bridge shelter, but I want to talk about this one. Apparently, the, 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 the deal is we're going to borrow from the reserve fund, which it's questionable whether or not you even have the authority to do that, and you're going to borrow and then you're going to repay it from a state grant for a bridge shelter that, according to Mr. Rue, is only going to be there for three years. Now, I wonder if the state is, and this project started in uh, the estimate, 5.6 million in September of 2019, went to 6.5 in November. Now it's 7.0, with 530,000 for the Bureau of, Eng of Engineering just over the top. A great idea, council, 
poorly executed is worth zero. Even an average idea well executed is worth a lot. This particular bridge shelter project is being very poorly executed. This money should not be approved. We'll, we'll, we'll see you in budget and finance. Thank you. Uh, Peter Meza will be followed by Rohan Beckett and then Rose Radanya. Uh, thank you for hearing me out. I'm here to support item four. Um, I'm a member of the Los Angeles County Older Adults Commission and the former Housing Authority Director for the City of Santa Monica. At that time, I was able to use tax increment um, dollars to fund a similar program. And I can tell you, homeless prevention housing assistance helps keep people from being homeless. And as you know, the largest population increase that we're seeing on the streets percentage-wise are seniors. Across the country, and including Los Angeles County, that that trend is, is projected to continue until at least the year 2025. Imagine yourself being 65 and older, becoming homeless for the first time in your life, simply because no matter how long you've lived in your unit, you can no longer afford to pay the rent. So I appreciate it. I know you have a difficult job allocating not enough money for too many needs, but prevention works. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Rohan Abeckett, followed by Rose Rodanya, followed by Vanessa Rios. Good afternoon, council members and members of the Homeless and Poverty Committee. Uh, my name is Rowan Beckett, and I've been a resident of Hollywood for around five and a half years. Um, during this time, my family and neighbours in, in the community have witnessed a steady increase in homelessness and vagrant communities take, take root in many pockets of our community. Our neighbourhood is grateful for the coordinated effort that we've seen over the past several months from LAPD, LA Sanitation and the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority to deploy care and care plus cleanup teams to some of the most entrenched vagrant encampments spread across our neighborhood. Prior to these cleanups, the streets are covered with posted notices advising that a cleanup is coming. Local LAPD community and outreach lets the targeted encampments know what is planned and officers are there in advance of the cleanup teams arriving. The individuals in these communities are given ample chance to pack up their, uh, their possessions before the cleanup commences. And with the Care Plus facilities, um, bathrooms are also provided. Um, we support this, the work this community, the committee is doing, demonstrated by the tax hike that we approved on Measure HHH several years ago. And we, uh, we, we thank you for the, uh, the continued cleanup work thank that is taking place. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Rose Rodania. Hello, Rose. Rose followed by Sam Rodriguez, followed by Vanessa Rios. Yes, good afternoon council persons. Uh, I'm in the Silver Lake Air and Sunset area. I've lived there all my life and this is what is a problem. This is regarding the Silver Lake Boulevard underpass bridge located at the 1200 Silver Lake Boulevard under the Sunset Boulevard. It's a gateway to the Silver Lake Reservoir and connecting to the south and the north side of Sunset. Our concern is that our beautiful old city dedicated archway brick bridge with its seal of the city has been trashed and taken over by the homeless for the past 10 years. The city has cleaned and maintained the bridge. The city has spent time and money to make it safe for the community by installing lighting in the tunnels like structure but to no avail the lights have been vandalized so thank, thank you rose that's it all right thanks for coming good to see you thank you um sam rodriguez followed by vanessa rios that, but i called you already didn't i right vanessa 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 Rios, go ahead, Vanessa. Yeah, uh, thanks. I'm here regarding item four. Uh, my name is Vanessa Rios. I'm a senior project manager for Corporation for Supportive Housing, commonly known as CSH. I'm here to really highlight the importance of addressing not only locally, but nationally. More importantly, also, it's important to highlight that it locally, uh, of our older adults, meaning our baby boomers, who are retiring are foreign born. They've contributed to our economy, many of them working in the caregiving sector, many of them providing uh, support for our families to help develop our local economy. Uh, we've seen the successes in Santa Monica, which is why it's so important for us to address this issue in a multiple levels, and prevention plays a key role, um, which is why we are in full support of this motion, and we want to definitely thank you for your support and your efforts to make this happen locally. Thank you, and that's a great point you made uh, with a, a very important segment of the population at risk. Thank you, Ms. Rios. Of course. Um, Sam Rodriguez. Hello, uh, everybody. Hello, sir. Um, I guess I want to speak on a couple of things related to this that um, 
Regarding, I've read a lot of the detail on the Martin uh, versus Boise circumstances right now. And, and I also have heard a lot about the complaints from homeless advocates regarding the municipal code 41.18 and the 56.11. And I respect those concerns. But I also am frustrated as a resident with the circumstances right now. And I really am hoping that the city, including the mayor, start aggressively pursuing these court cases, you know, continuing these court cases, not, uh, not settling for the circumstances right now. Um, I believe that uh, the homeless people have a right, but I do not think that they have a right to um, place a tent anywhere at any location in the city. And that is my concern right now, and I'm willing to uh, educate myself further about these kind of circumstances, but at the same time express the, this opinion that I think a lot of my neighbors thank share you. these sentiments. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Um, all right, next, uh, our final three speakers will be Helen Elgenberg, Maura Kelly, and Lisa Hutchins. I don't see any other names. I put it in the computer. On here. And it should be there. Okay, well, we'll add you. All right, so. Three minutes. Um, <laughs> do we, um, is, is Helen Eigenberg? Yes. Okay, please have a seat. Maura Kelly and Lisa Hutchins, you can all step forward. Uh, Ms. Ms. Elgenberg. Hi, um, my name is Helen Eigenberg, and I'm here in support of item 7, the repurposing of St. Vincent's, and also item 11 that my council member David Ruiz put forward. I'll just tell you really quickly, I was driving on Vermont and Beverly the other night at 7 p.m., and a woman walked into the street and squatted and went to the bathroom. We can't let people live like this. This is not letting people live with dignity. Housing is a human right, and we need to house people and do whatever we can. And it may take all of us making some sacrifices, and we really have to do it. Mm -hmm. So thank you. In support of 7 11. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moira Kelly. Hi, I'm uh, uh, in support of 7 Eleven as well. I have to say one thing I'm a retired. Are in living in the city of Los Angeles, and I am devastated by our crisis of homelessness and mental illness. I see it every day on our streets, and I highly support the fact that when we have a crisis like this, we need to do critical things, and I really support St. Vincent's Hospital being bought by the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Hutchins. I'm Lisa, and I live in Councilman Ryu's district, a former member of the Wilshire Neighborhood Council. Um, I'm here to support item number 7 and 11, and I think it's very obvious to everyone here what an impact obtaining the St. Vincent's Hospital, former St. Vincent's Hospital. I can't imagine there would be any objection. If there is any, I would love to hear it, because I... There, in addition to me, I'm a block captain, and everyone I've spoken to in my neighborhood has only been positive for this. So I think you need to hear that, and I wish there were more people that could attend here, but people do have jobs and lives that pro right. prohibit them from that. And so I thank everyone here who's made that effort to get here by hook or by crook. And if there was anything else we could do as citizens, we're voters, um, let, let us know reach out in some small way to individual, you know, block captains, Wilshire Neighborhood Council. We need to have a better dialogue as to how these things can Im be implemented because we're all here to have them be implemented. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone who testified on 7 sticks around because I am going to make a big suggestion to everyone. And we have, my office has received hundreds and hundreds of letters in support. Don't know if we've reached the 1,000 mark yet, but... Thank you. But this is, uh, this idea is a winner all the way around. But we're not there yet. I mean, it's going up for auction. And I'll talk about it when it comes up. But, but there are things that we can do. Mr. Chair, for the record, I think they were in support of item 12, which is in my district in Los Feliz. But I think they, mm -hmm. if they knew about 11, which is in Council District 6, they're also supportive of that, too. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Patricia yes. McAllister here. Thank you. Patricia okay, so Ms. McAllister, you have one minute for general and two minutes for yes, your sir. items. Yes, But sir. we don't have you on the system, so after this, if you wouldn't mind filling out, and you'll be the last speaker Okay, today. that's fine. Thanks. Um, 
I'm African American and I get questions from everybody, why do we have 20,000 African Americans on Skid Row with children, why are they all over the street? So my job, what I'm doing is, I'm looking out for African Americans. I went to Lhasa, I said I want a freedom of information request. I want to know how many housing, how many housing units have you given to Hispanics? And it was nearly a thousand and a handful of African Americans. So what I'm finding is the discrimination is in these service areas. Now, Lhasa's director, after I announced that in City Hall, in the city chambers, Lhasa's director, Peter Lynn, resigned two weeks later. Okay, so I'm, I'm serious about what I'm doing, okay? Now, this money you're using, I'm glad that gentleman mentioned number 12. I went and looked up the occupations and degrees of all these people we've elected. The controller is a lawyer. He's not a certified public accountant. That is an elected position. That should not be an elected position. That should be a, a salaried position. We need a certified public accountant. I used to go down there all the time. I studied accounting at Chicago State University. And I would ask him, where are the receipts? You know, like, 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 like this, uh, five million for a bridge. Bridge, do what? What are you doing in this shelter? You need five million for it. They told me, well, we do our own. Uh, we, I, I said, Who, who's doing the auditing? We audit ourselves. I said, what do you mean you audit yourself? Well, we got some friends that ought to see. I was suspicious at all the time what's going on over there. And the reason why we're in this position because he's not qualified and he didn't know that he was supposed to give us all these reports. You've got to be a C certified public accountant to do that job. The people who work under you are not going to do your job because they feel like they're going to insult you if they tell you you need to be doing certain reports. They're going to do their job. So that's how we got stuck in this. Now. I also have all the listings of this HHH funding, and I have it broken down, the cost. Do you know how much they're charging us? You guys are paying these developers for a studio? $300,000 per unit. $300,000, you're throwing away our taxpayer money, and I know you're in with these developers. You're getting some kind of cut, and the cut you put in, the, in our agendas. You say, okay, we got this developer, ABC Company, he's got the, this, this project we, we, we awarded him, and he's giving us $500,000 to go into so-and-so fund. That's a kickback. But you're legalizing it, you know, by telling us and, and saying, hey, now, this fund you made up yesterday, that money's going in your pockets. I've discovered that once we get a real CPA in here, certified public accountant, some people going to the penitentiary, I want an independent audit. Not an audit coming from inside. If you say you're doing five million on this bridge housing, I want some receipts. So it's like if I go buy a dress, they're gonna give me a receipt. I worked in accounting once. That accounting office gets receipts. We're gonna get some, you can believe that. That's why my name, they didn't find my name. Okay, thank you. Uh, please uh, go ahead and for the record, fill out the comment and, uh, uh, and the kiosk. And the comment period is closed. And just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to state for the record. I'll take a picture. Miss, okay. Uh, right. Misunderstandings lead to uh, really mis, uh, you know, misinformation. The city contributes no more than 140000 per unit, no matter how much the unit costs as part of the me measure HHH pipeline. It's really important for everyone to understand that. The costs vary per unit depending on the project. The last round that this committee approved uh, was the innovation fund. We took 10% of that bond and approved a very innovative approach uh, uh, to the tune of 1,001 additional units, all at a much more modest price per unit. But even then, the city doesn't contribute more than 140,000 per unit, whether it's 550,000 per unit or whether it's 350,000 per unit. Just to make sure that everyone understands that a lot of misunderstanding gets put out in, in uh, the universe, but, but that's, that's the process. Um, okay, Ms. McAllister, you're disrupting. Um, uh, and Mr. harris Dawson, did you want to make a comment, sir? Yeah, no, I thank you. I thank you for pointing out the sort of blatant misrepresentation and, and uh, creating double meanings uh, around issues that are very, very big and very, very important. Uh, also, I, a few folks got up and talked about 5611 and the Boise lawsuit. You know, the the trouble for us on this side, and it's something for folks to consider, and not a very popular or smart thing for an elected official to say, but I'll say it. We never get sued by neighborhoods because of health conditions. We never get sued by homeowners because of health conditions. And 
perhaps if we had to respond to such a lawsuit, right. some of these things might be different. Right. right now, the lawsuits that we're responding to all come from well-meaning advocates and people who fight for the conditions of homeless people. We don't ever go to court and have to answer uh, to homeowners and residents of the city uh, what it means to have a encampment in the alley by your house uh, at any given time. And so um, I, I, I just put that out there, uh, not to weigh in on one side or the other, but just to say, like, there's, there's only really one side suing, so. Yes. I'm not encouraging anything. I'm just pointing out the landscape. Hey, let's, let's keep the order here. Um, so, colleagues, what I'm going to recommend is uh, that we um, take items two, three, five, six, eight, nine, and ten on consent if there are no objections. Items two, three, five, six, eight, nine, and ten, leaving us to hear the following items, one, four, and seven. What about 11, 12, 13? Um, and the, those two. Yes, right? Yeah, we'll hear those two. Thank you. We're going to hear them or? Well, well, uh, so the items on consent are 2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 10, if there aren't objections. The, and we'll hear, we'll hear all the other items. Right? Okay, so, so that'll be the order. Um, and that then, uh, that mystery will bring us to item number 7. We'll start with item 7. Item number seven, motion O'Farrell Krikorian relative to exploring the feasibility of purchasing and repurposing the facility located at 2131 West 3rd Street for wraparound services, including substance abuse assistance, rehabilitation services, and interim or permanent housing on site. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. So there has been so much support for, for this item. Um, and I just have to say that I really want to compliment Supervisor Hilda Solis also because St. Vincent's is in the first supervisorial district, but also in the 13th council district. The county supervisors are moving forward with a plan. The city is moving forward with an evaluation, similarly. And the bottom line is, um, up until the middle of January, uh, when a judge determined that St. Vincent's could close and stop, be, you know, stop uh, operating as a hospital and be sold at auction, um, we put our heads together and said, we have to do something about this. Um, we had, my office had been uh, working with um, the Daughters of Charity for many months on a different site uh, that is right next to St. Vincent um, to build permanent supportive housing. That process will move forward as well, but in the meantime, this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity came up. Um, the stories that we all hear uh, from people experiencing homeless, homelessness all over the city is something that has become a universal known now. Um, the stories, the, the commonality here that, that everyone has experienced, whether they've been in the camp, encampments themselves, like all of us here have, and many of you, or whether or not you see it on the street where you live or the street where you work, there's one common value there, one common great need, and that is we need more services and we need more housing. Uh, the crisis we're facing is a call to action for all of us, and I think this St. Vincent opportunity galvanized that for so many people. Um, we're working on the urgent need to find safe, temporary shelter and permanent housing for folks all over the city, and we're all working on immediate solutions. With this motion, what I strive to do is explore the feasibility of purchasing and repurposing the soon-to-close St. Vincent Medical Center. I want to imagine a new life for it as a place that provides wraparound services, including assistance for those struggling with substance abuse, rehabilitation services, interim permanent housing on-site, mental health services. I want to thank uh, Supervisor Solis and her staff for your collaboration on this and everyone in the county to move forward as quickly as possible. There's also a large medical building on site that could be repurposed into housing. We talk a lot about the 366 beds, but the, the facility and the acreage is enormous. It could accomplish so much more than just that, not to mention safe parking as well. There's a huge parking structure attached to this site, uh, and uh, it's, it's a very, very large site. As I mentioned before, we've received hundreds of letters. 
But everyone can do the following. We know that Apple has offered $1 billion to address homelessness in the state of California. Let's all send them a letter saying, we have your site. We have your site right here. We'll have to have it appraised, but the creditor of St. Vincent's is the owner of the Los Angeles Times, Patrick Soon Shong. He's the creditor. It's out there. It's public. It's, it's a fact. We can, we can compel him as well to take some action. That's perfectly fair of all of us. Uh, and so I think that's worth a try. When, when you ask how we can help in this effort, we can collectively approach this. The need is there. This facility is in a location where there is great need, significant need. It's within, um, you know, it's, it's close to downtown. It's close to some of the epicenters of homelessness. Um, and this is a once in a generation opportunity and we're all dead serious about this possibility. We know that it will no longer operate as a hospital. We know that it can be repurposed as an acute care uh, center and uh, there are facilities where it could be repurposed for permanent homes as well. It has it all. It's going to cost a whole lot. Um, what, I, what I hope is that as we move forward with the appraisals, with the evaluations, that some good Samaritan will go to auction and pick it up, buy it, and turn it over so that we can utilize it, we can get the services, we can use incoming state money and existing state money and monies that we've collected through these various measures that voters have approved in the city of Los Angeles and make this vision come to reality. But it will take all of us, more than myself, more than us, it will take all of us. So I'm encouraged so far by the responses we've had. Uh, and I don't really see any significant obstacle of opposition for folks who just don't like the idea of it uh, because the need is so great and everyone realizes that. So um, we don't have a report today. We're just going to adopt this motion, get it through council, and get all of these appraisals going with a great sense of urgency while we all actively reach out to others that we know can help and assist. So that's, that's my ask of you who have said, what can we do to help? Uh, and I hope you'll join us in this journey. Thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Marquis, Harris Dawson. Uh, I just want to uh, applaud the committee chair for moving so quickly on this issue. Um, when the, the story broke about that facility, uh, literally every community meeting I went to, a neighborhood a meeting I went to, all the way in South LA, people were like, well, what are you going to do about the hospital? What are you going to do about the hospital? So uh, I really uh, am proud and appreciate being able to go back to my constituents and saying, we're moving on it, we're moving on it as aggressively as possible. So thank you for leading the way in that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, we're all in this together. There's no barrier between <laughs> us and you. We're also constituents of the city and we all care deeply. We have uh, neighbors who are homeless, experiencing homelessness as well. And you all have made that abundantly clear in your own testimony. So I really appreciate the support on this. Uh, Mr. Rue. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. And I, I just want to echo um, what Mark, Councilman Marquis Harris Dawson also said. Yes, e even in my district as well, there were many, many, many inquiries. And I really want to applaud your leadership on this uh, to our yes. chair for moving on this. Uh, which is also in your district as well. Uh, but I also want to make it clear, and in your presentation, you talked about that the campus is large. I mean, you're more intimately familiar with, familiar with the campus because it's in your district. Um, and, you know, this is an enormous project that we can't do alone in the city of L.A. Right. Uh, and I'm glad that you're talking uh, with uh, Supervisor Hilda Solis, who has taken a leadership role. Um, and, you know, there's so, many, so much need and service needs in the city of L.A. and the county of L.A. where... This, the utilization of this hospital, staying in a hospital setting with possibly having a wing with alcohol, drug rehab, or mental health services. Um, and when it comes to housing, I wasn't aware of that other bu additional building, but, but possibly building on the vacant land. Uh, that might actually be cheaper than refurbishing this ex existing building, and it might be better to keep the existing building in a hospital medical type setting. So I, I'm glad the fact that we're exploring all options. I think the city of LA could definitely participate um, and 
if the opportunity pre uh, presents itself, and I know you will take the lead, and I know we'll all be supportive in, in pitching in to make sure that we are able to purchase, refurbish, or add on to um, making this into some sort of comprehensive campus for homelessness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've also made our local delegation in Sacramento aware of this on a trip that I took last week. I had 11 meetings, and I talked about this 11 different times. Because we know that another state funding bill for homelessness is being uh, envisioned right now. So uh, I'm making frequent trips to Sacramento, so this becomes part of the narrative as well. Um, so the, the, further, the furthest and widest we can cast this net, the better our chances will be. So it's aspirational, but the, the, the good thing here is that it's entirely doable. The resources exist. We just have to cobble them together to make this happen. So. We all need to pray and manifest that this will happen and make those calls and write those letters. Thank you so much. And with that, I recommend that we adopt the motion and we move forward. With no objection, that'll be the order. Thank you so much. All right, anticlimactic. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Let's give a round of applause. So, uh, uh, colleagues, so what we'll do is take items 11, <laughs> 11 12, and 13 uh, together, and we have. Uh, Mr. Reef, if you'd uh, read the item, and then we'll have the CEO come up and present. Item number 11, motion martinez Gregorian relative to approving funds in the amount of $3,885,300 for the Crisis and Bridge Housing Project proposed at 14333 Etna Street. Item number 12, a motion rule of Farrell Krikorian relative to approving funds in the amount of $5,631,255 for the Crisis and Bridge Housing Project proposed at 3210 and 3248 Riverside Drive. And item number 13, motion of Farrell Rodriguez relative to approving funds in the amount of $3,546,978.24 for the Crisis and Bridge Housing Project proposed at 1215 Lodi Place, and note that all three items were also referred to the Budget and Finance Committee. Terrific. Thank you. We have the CEO's office uh, to present. Uh, please. Hi, I'm Helene Bertolo. I'm with the City Administrative Officer's Office, and I work with Meg Barclay, the City's Homelessness Coordinator. Uh, before you are three motions uh, to fund three projects for the Bridge Home Program uh, in CD4, CD6, and CD13. Uh, for CD4 and CD6, uh, this, uh, this body has approved uh, initial funding for the membrane structures and hygiene trailers and design for Riverside and for the Aetna project. Um, and the request is to uh, complete the funding. Uh, BOE has awarded a contractor um, and needs these funds in their accounts in order, uh, sorry, they have identified a contractor and they need these funds in their accounts in order to move forward uh, with uh, off authorizing the bid. Um, and for the 1215 Lodi place, um, that is a, a lease uh, with the YWCA uh, in Council District 13 to uh, extend or expand upon an existing a bridge home. Uh, there's uh, currently 64 beds. This will add 60 beds, uh, totaling uh, 124 beds for women and uh, Tay um, population. I want to note that the uh, Aetna site actually came in at uh, one point, about $1.7 million less than what was requested in the HAP report. Uh, the Riverside site, the, the total cost did increase by $500,000. And for Lodi Place, there was an increase in the leasing costs for about uh, 340000 And that was because there was an additional square footage added to the site for the courtyard to meet uh, programmatic requirements for accessibility for those with disabilities. Terrific. Um, can you just expand on the reserve fund details just a little bit? Sure. So in order to uh, keep these projects moving forward and not slow down the amazing progress that our, our city departments have made, um, we are requesting the reserve fund loan. Uh, we anticipate that we will have uh, the, the $117 million grant from the state for the um, Homeless Housing and Prevention Program by April 1st. Our office submitted the application on Friday. Uh, and we have been, um, we are pre-awarded that $117 million grant, so it's really just waiting on that money to hit our, our accounts. Mm -hmm. So rather than delay these projects, uh, we are requesting the reserve fund loan so that they can continue to move forward, and we anticipate that they should be able to be repaid by mid-April. Okay. And what is the anticipated funding source for ongoing services? 
resources? So for Lodi Place, uh, we do have, I believe, Measure, M Measure H money mm -hmm. uh, committed from the county. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the moment, for Aetna and Riverside, we are still looking to identify the source for operation, the funding source for operations. Okay. Um, and we're working on compelling the county to expand beyond the 600 bed ceiling that they've imposed. And yeah. we'll continue doing that. That's right. On, a, on Measure H funding, yeah. That's right, and, and as well as their own HAP al uh, allocation. Right, thank you. Meg, did you have anything to add? Yeah, the one thing I just wanted to add is based on the numbers that um, Helene reported for uh, each of the projects. And we, ha we do have a net decrease across these three projects in the overall amount of HAP funding that was originally reserved versus what is needed as a result of the bids coming in and um, the, the final budget. So there's, so far we are coming in a little bit well, almost a million dollars less mm -hmm. than what was originally reserved for these projects. There's a number of bridge home projects that are still, um, still, you know, still to come. So, but we are staying inside the total amount that was res reserved for the uh, bridge home program within the um, state HAP grant. Mm -hmm. And I just want to state for the record, and, and we'll, we'll, you know, everyone can can weigh in here. But, for example, Lodi Place, it's a built facility. Mm -hmm. The third floor was vacant, empty, just waiting for a good use, and we found a good use. Everything costs money. You know, hundreds of thousands get bandied about in this committee, millions of, get bandied about, but everything costs real money, and everything has to abide by certain required standards, right, for structures, et cetera. Uh, but we are leaning in the direction of even more innovative approaches, even for our bridge housing sites. That's right. And less of a let's pour a slab and, and you know, build plumbing and build a semi-permanent for several million dollars. We still have some of that to do, just because that's the nature of the beast, but that's, that's starting to become modified, and we're finding less expensive ways to build temporary bridge shelter. And I think that's part of the story that we need to tell as well. Um, uh, as we move with a great sense of urgency to get these beds filled and get people the services they deserve. So I just I wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, questions or comments? Mr. Bonin? Uh, just one, one or two. Uh, between these three items and anything else we may have done previously, how much are we obligated to subtract from the HAP fund obligation, the HAP fund award, in order to repay the reserve? So for all of the, um, rec the, all of the pro um, sites that were recommended in the HAP report that we anticipate will actually need a reserve fund loan. Um, it would be, at most, $22 million. I know that sounds shocking. Um, but with some of these sites, they are lease-based. So Lodi Place, um, CD5 introduced a motion uh, for 1479 La Cienega uh, on Friday uh, that will go through this committee in budget and finance as well. So what we have asked for is an up-to amount for those leased sites so that we can... Um, we can pay the security deposit, we can pay the first month's rent, maybe the second month rent, and then we anticipate that we will have HAP in place. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to make sure that the service providers were felt secure and that the city was actually supporting them on these leases, particularly for 1479 La Cienega. Uh, that will be a direct lease with the service provider, and no service provider was willing to sign a lease without us having an actual dedicated for, uh, I, I understand the logic behind it all m m makes sense. The, the point I'm making, though, is we, we've all been, everybody's been putting in motions. More money for seniors, more money for youth, shared housing, all of that. <clears throat> Looking forward to a discussion that we're going to have about how to spend $117 million, yeah. mm -hmm. which ain't going to be nearly enough, $117 million for all the stuff that's been put in. But we're really not talking about $117 million. We're talking about 95 or $98 million. I understand. Um, so, as, and I'll jump in here on the, the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Program grant from the state. As you recall, that report came through in December of, of last year. And the, the amount of money that we reserved in, the, in that grant and in the application for the Abridge Home Program was about $50 million in order to um, provide the capital funding that was needed for the remaining sites that had been identified for a bridge home. I, 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 just, I just want to, we had this discussion back then, I remember asking mm -hmm. this line of questioning, and I, the big thing I was told is these are just sort of 
placeholder percentages, and they're flexible. What, what I'm just trying to point out is that the discussion we're supposed to be having about how to spend $117 million, mm -hmm. we have, without that big deliberative discussion where everybody's involved, we have reduced that by, we, we've chopped one-sixth of it off. Oh, actually, so in the report where we talked about um, the HAP reservations, the bridge home, um, the bridge home category was based on a list of sites that we were aware of and estimates for those sites. Those are, and so those we wanted to make sure you all had as much information as possible about what that set aside was being recommended for. The balance of the funding, there are categories and we described the eligible activities for those categories. Those are the funds that would be allocated according to the motions that you're talking about outside of the bridge home and they're not, and nothing has been decided about the allocation of that funding outside of the bridge home where we had recommended the fund be reserved for these specific projects that were listed in the report. So there's no, that nothing else has been committed or reserved outside of that bridge home category. All of the rest of it will follow the process that was outlined in the report. And how much total has been reserved for bridge? 50 million. 50. So, okay, so when we talk about 117 million, right. we're actually like talking about 68. 68 million. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I remember the conversation differently from December is that these categories we're making are just sort of placeholder and everything is flexible, but it's a lot less flexible because we spent. There's, yeah, there's a specific set of sites that, yeah, were identified and had been identified by council districts um, as, and we had determined those to be feasible, but at, in order to limit, at least limit beyond that list, that was the known list at the time that we thought would be, um, was likely to come to fruition um, that this committee recommended to the council and the council approved the recommendation to limit and not add any more sites. So I, I, I understand. Yeah. I, you don't need to defend it. I'm not saying it's either right or wrong. I'm just saying I don't think we're having, we're framing the conversation right. Okay. And I think we need to know that as we're putting all these motions in and the mm -hmm. stuff we really want, How we have a lot less left? money than we, 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 we mm -hmm. talk about. Yes, sir. Exactly. Thank you. Um, Mr. Harris Dawson? Yep. Mr. Rue? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I really want to thank a lot of the community members from my district that came out today to support of item number 12, the Riverside Project. Um, and, you know, and I got to say, um, this might be, and I, I could ask my colleagues, where um, the community support for this project was tremendous. Um, it had one of the least opposition areas um, and the strongest community support. With, hey, with, you're interrupting the meeting. You're disrupting the meeting. And you can't do, okay, that was your second, one more and you're out of here. So whether, what, it was the neighborhood council, the homeowners association, SELA group who helped my office do even more outreach, more uh, uh, meeting with the community. So I want to say, you know, it, 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 uh, in comparison to other experiences that I've had as well as my colleagues have had in other neighborhoods, this was a fantastic experience and I think it's something that sets the bar for the rest of the city because when we do come together, we can tackle this crisis together. And. And, and I really want to thank uh, uh, members of my district because it's... Okay, you just disrupted. You you're you're going to leave the meeting. Fair enough. Mr. Rue? You're out. Thank you. Not telling you. Just for the record, he continues to disrupt the meeting as he makes his exit. So, and, and it's not just uh, constituents in Los Feliz and Silver Lake, but it's all throughout uh, from, the, from my district as well as the city of LA. Um, and whether it's stories from the front line and we have uh, Marilyn Wells and many of the founders here, and whether it's United Way, everyone in, I think this is how, an example of how we can get projects, do, projects done. So I really thank everybody for coming here. And I do have one question. Fortunately, I wanted um, the person who left to hear this, but uh, the project cost is seven, seven million, seven point one million, basically, um, and it's going to be a hundred beds, I believe, right? It is a hundred beds. So the average, checking my math, it's about seventy-one thousand per bed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, and, and good job on on your leadership on that, Mr. Rue. Um, so, without objection, we will approve all three motions, and that'll be the order. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and that'll take us to uh, item number one, Mr. Reef. Item number one, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority to provide an update on plans to allocate its share of the state's homeless housing assistance and prevention program grant funding in consideration of losses other funding sources, such as the state homeless emergency aid program grant and LA County Measure H. Thank you. Welcome. 
Good afternoon, council members. My name is Emily Andrade, and I'm one of the directors at the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. And I'm pleased to present LASA's plan to apply for the state's Homeless Assistance and Prevention Program, also known as HAP. So first, I'd like to pre present a quick overview of HAP. So HAP came about from negotiations between the governor and state legislature in 2019 to deliver $650 million in one-time funding avail available to use over five years. Allocations were determined by point-in-time counts. The timeline for the application is due February 15th, with awards scheduled for this, ap this April. So as you can see up here, um, Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles is expected to get $117 million. Um, Los Angeles County is expected to get $65 million. And then LASA, being a continuum of care, is expected to get $66 million. All of the uses within this application, they'll be going to major programs and interventions for our system that we already have. And then there is an expectation that at least 8% of the ward um, serves transitioned age, age youth or TAY. So one of the things that LASA did is we held um, eight input sessions across all eight service planning areas, spas, throughout the month of November. We received feedback um, from, there were about 550 attendees at all of the areas, and then we also posted an online survey that, um, where we received 100 responses for people who couldn't attend in person. We also attended um, our lived experience advisory board, our homeless youth forum, of Los Angeles and our Los Angeles Continuum of Care Board and presented our plans there as well throughout January, December and January. So up next is a summary of all of our input. Um, for LASA, these are kind of the overall themes that came about um, during those sessions and that surfaced across the program, these categories, these program categories. So for prevention, we um, saw that it was important to increase the level of prevention and through, uh, excuse me, through additional flexibility and partnering with our cities. So being able to work with um, different types of populations, inclusive of less acute populations as well. For um, access and engagement, which is our street based, there was a request for more mental health <coughs> led outreach, so our street-based programming. Themes across, kind of actually across a lot of these programs were pointed with um, a request to have more peers with lived experience support these programs as well. So for services, there was um, a, a broad theme of a request for more hygiene, trash receptacles, mobile showers, and restrooms for people who are literally street homeless. For interim housing, there was an, a request for increased, sir, um, increased interim housing services across all service providing planning areas. And again, the need for peer support, especially for youth. For subsidized housing, there was a request again for flexibility with um, vulnerable populations and rental assistance and building out available um, affordable housing stock. Other, other considerations were to continue to support capacity building for growing agencies and continuing to have data and training support for um, our HMIS system, our homeless management information system. And there was another call out for more substance abuse services across the board. So the next slide, um, you'll actually see our proposed HAP expenditure plan. So our plan is meant to support our system for the next two to three years. We really wanted to ensure that the programs that we're building out um, will be able to continue to operate. And we wanted to demonstrate our need to use this funding um, in a similar time frame as our partners at the city and the county. We did work with the city and the county closely to make sure that our application wasn't duplicating efforts that they also had put forth. So I'm gonna talk through some of our requests. So for the first one, we for rapid rehousing, um, we have 
proposed 18 million, and that will sustain our current rapid rehousing portfolio, a portion of it. And then also we will be potentially testing out a new program for roommate, a roommate housing subsidy. For prevention and diversion, we are looking at providing, sustaining our problem solving prevention programming. We also want to do some more training with various staff. Um, we also want to expand our prevention for our shallow subsidy program. We have a couple other, yeah, yeah. For system support and infrastructure, this is the area that we would like to continue sustaining our capacity building um, and doing more work with CES to ensure that it's efficacy through refinement and testing and also to support our data training. We want to make sure that we're training our providers to utilize HMIS the way that, that it's meant to. For Tay, we are we do plan to use the set aside for 8% as required, but we're anticipating it'll probably be actually about 10%. And that will fall into buckets of, of rapid rehousing, problem solving, uh, again, and then we have our uh, Tay access centers that we plan to fund. And finally, we have our navigation centers and shelters. This is really just to sustain our interim housing portfolio. This will support the building out of family and adult interim housing, bridge housing, enhanced bridge housing, and then some safe parking. So with that, with the, that gets us to our total. And then for innovations, some of the ideas that we've, that, that we've brought up are prevention and shallow subsidy for all populations. So right now we have a prevention program that really focuses on seniors. So once their rapid rehousing program ends, they can um, utilize, utilize shallow subsidy if they're an older adult for an extended period of time. We're proposing to expand that to all populations, which is a new innovation. It's actually not done outside of supportive services for veteran families. So this would be new for Los Angeles. We are also proposing some problem solving trainings with municipal and elected staff. What we're finding is that there are more and more home homeless individuals and families that are requesting assistance directly from, from various departments. And what we would like to do is train those departments to have the skills to utilize problem solving techniques so that they can divert out of the homeless system and then also have access to the problem solving assistance funds. And then finally, our roommate housing subsidy program. This is a new idea that, that we plan to support families, individuals, and youth to move into shared housing environments where they would be um, receive a rental subsidy for up to three months. It's for the less acute population. And then so finally for next steps, we will be, we, we took this to our commission on January 24th. It was approved and then we are sending our application in um, by February 15th for the award in April. <coughs> That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, um, a few quick questions uh, for you. Just one thing just pops into my head immediately. In the category of innovations and, and approaches to uh, uh, services and matching people with beds and homes and temporary shelter, et cetera, um, the transitional age youth is a, also a growing population in homelessness. Can you talk a little bit about the reunification efforts and if you have that information and what that has informed you of. Um, I don't want to make any blanket assumptions, but it, the reason it's fresh in my mind is I've gone to the, the transitional aged youth for, for males, the 30 bed winter shelter in Hollywood a couple of times. Um, a lot of these young men are just fresh from leaving home from wherever. Um, and I'm not going to, for, for the obvious reasons, I'm not going to intrude upon what their stories are because we know that sometimes they come from abuse situations, but sometimes it's also a family misunderstanding. Uh, so what, what can you say about reunification efforts with this population, but even beyond that? You know, I can't give, I can't get into this because Mm -hmm. specifics sure. about the Tay population at the time at this moment but I'm sure we could provide a report back on it what I can say is another part of of what we're think we're we're 
we'd like to propose for prevention is a family reunification stabilization service, mm -hmm. which would really strengthen and, and expand the, it's with it, so it's within problem solving. Mm -hmm. And what it is is would be hiring licensed clinicians who would be able to support people reunifying with their families should they return home. Mm -hmm. Now, that would also be available for transition age youth. Mm -hmm. But specifically, other ideas, I'd have to come back. Okay. I know there are groups and individuals ready to come together and help pay for transportation, even if it's across country. Uh, so, so just something to, to stick a pin in, if you will. Um, and then in terms of um, losses, HAP funding priorities, um, with a, a city-specific perspective, um, I, I am really always coming from this place of we have 40% of the county population, we have one quarter of the state's homeless population in the city limits of Los Angeles. So can you talk a little bit about your city of LA focus in terms of where your resources are allocated or plan to be allocated for? So what we, we typically do is we, we, when we put out an RFP, we will focus on the pockets of homelessness where they are. Depending on what the service is, um, we look at the geographic area and, and provide um, services based closest to where homeless individuals are. In addition to that, we also, depending on what the service is, try to support each service planning area as well, which sometimes does fall outside of the city. Okay, well, that's great. I, I just think if, if LASA could help identify the sort of um, service area gaps in the infrastructure, for example, the bottom line is the city of Los Angeles has one-fourth of the state's homeless population. We should get services commensurate with the need. And if there are gaps in the infrastructure to allocate that funding, we need to know what, what those gaps are and where they are. If we're falling short on the delivery of services somewhere because it's just, it just isn't there, but yet the homeless population is growing, we're going to need to, to, to know that. I just uh, want to put that out there as well. And then um, um, how closely are you hewing with the point in time count from last year, because those are the only numbers we have, um, but how has that informed your approach? Well, I, I suppose that's kind of a, a, a difficult question because you kind of you kind of went there with the previous answer in terms of where you go to. Yeah, I mean, um, we again we look at all, where our, our homeless individuals are, and then we allocate resources based on the homeless count annually, anyway. And then you look for yep. the service providers to match up Correct. with. Okay, all right, that kind of addresses the previous question already. So sorry about that. And then the the folks that are at risk or really close to becoming homeless, the, the 800,000 city residents that are severely rent burdened, in other words, the acuity issue. Uh, Mr. Bonnet has a motion in. We talked about this. We had a very lively discussion last time. We've talked about it before um, when Peter Lynn was sitting where you are about a year ago uh, because LASA had a, a focus of high, high acuity priority first, but we know that if folks are hovering near homelessness or have recently become homeless, it's of paramount importance to get them rapidly rehoused before it becomes acute. So uh, if you could uh, talk a little bit about that and, and where LASA is on your acuity piece now. We are hoping that we can expand to look at the, some of the lower acuities by looking at the, rap, the roommate housing subsidy program as well. Mm -hmm. We realize that there are people that are falling into homelessness that don't necessarily need the wraparound intensive case <laughs> management. And I think some of these programs would provide that support. Mm -hmm. In addition to expanding the shallow subsidy to all populations, mm -hmm. that would give us some, some breadth for that too, because there might be families that just, and individuals that do not need intensive case management, but still need the support while they receive those services. If, if someone who's recently homeless just gets a safe place to sleep at night before they fall into the, the, the terrors of homelessness that are experienced all over the city, that's when they become acute. So, so I think, I think we've, I've made my point on that question, so, so thank you. And um, lastly for me, um, what other sources of funding for mental health services 
does Lhasa have that we may not know about? Well, Lhasa doesn't necessarily have mental health funding. We okay. work with the, the county. county. Yeah, all county. The, so it's all the county programs mm -hmm. and we ensure that our programs are connected with them and mm -hmm. you know we have access to those s services. Basically. And of course through that you get existing funding from traditional sources plus their own HAP funding for mental services that they've allocated? That would be the county through <coughs> right. yeah, the yeah. Through that, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Colleagues, Mr. Bonner? Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you for uh, mm -hmm. preaching the gospel of the acuity issue. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be hearing so much traction on that because I think it's a huge. Well, everybody knows what I think about it. Um, so I don't expect you to have an answer to this right now, but it's a question I've asked Mr. Lynn for a couple of years: is what do we expect to get from this? This is one of the few budgets we talk about where we talk about how we want to spend money and we don't talk about what we're going to get from it. When we do uh, our, our funding for LADOT, we have, a, we have a sense of how many traffic control officers we'll have, how many new stop signs, or how many new traffic lights we'll have, how many speed homes we'll do. When we do street resurfacing, we know how many street miles we're going to do. When we did Triple H, we, we had a, a, a set goal of, of, of 10,000. That's what we hoped that that amount of money would, would get for us. One of my continuing frustrations in, in this issue is we never really know what we're supposed to get for the money. So we never know how to evaluate whether or not it was successful or, or wisely spent. Uh, uh, again, I'm not expecting you to be able to pull these numbers you know, out, of your, out of your back pocket right now, but I'd like to get some sense of, of, of what we expect to get from this. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and when, we, when, when LASA comes back, I, I expect that kind of stuff. Uh, and, I, I've been asking for a while, and it just it, it hasn't been forthcoming. And I think it, I'm going to keep talking to Lassa about it because it's unfair to us as policymakers. It's unfair to uh, people who are, are living on the streets to not know if we're doing things wisely. Um, a, a couple general concerns and a couple specific questions. There's a lot of stuff in here I like. I, I'm absolutely thrilled to see the talk about the interim housing, the peer support, and all that. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff I love in the comprehensive homelessness strategy we spent a lot of time doing that we just we, we haven't done very much of. Or you know, shared housing was in there. We've barely done that. Uh, safe parking was in there. That, that program has barely launched uh, and has never left sort of you know, neonatal ICU. Um, and I, I, I want to get a sense of uh, of the money we're talking about. Uh, how much of this do we actually think will get spent on people of lower acuities? How much of this do we think will get spent on interim housing versus subsidized housing? We have the, the pots, but I don't have a sense of, um, you know, from the summary of input page, where, where things will go. I know you got it broken down on page four, but yeah, that doesn't really tell me how much for interim housing. And that, that's the kind of information I'm looking for. I mean, you can report back on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think right now my understanding is that the, for interim housing, it is the majority that would go to interim housing. It would just be different interim housing sites. But um, all the different programs, yeah, how they break out, I don't have that for you. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the, the way you described interim housing on the, the summer of input, uh, an increased level of interim housing across the continuum with peer support, that's shared housing. That's, that's, that's a lot of the shared housing model. It's like the model at least that share in particular uses. Uh, peer support is sort of built into their model. Uh, on, the, on the rapid rehousing, um, uh, I've had concerns that some of the rapid rehousing in the past couple of years has actually been spent on the wrong populations. Um, and has been spent on people with higher acuity, uh, where it's not as successful an intervention, and then we, they, they fall back into homelessness, and we've lost the opportunity to save the person of, of lower acuity for whom it would have been the, the resolution. Uh, so I, I, I'd like to know what the target population is for rapid rehousing, because the, 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 the studies I've seen about how successful it is 
is more successful with, with, with low to mid acuity than higher acuity? I, we, we would have to come back and present a whole presentation on rapid rehousing, which we were willing to okay. do as well. Uh, when you do that, I, I, I don't happen to know, and so I'm not going to speculate, how successful rapid rehousing is with Tay. Uh, in, in my part of town, I know we've been using rapid rehousing and there's been some success. I'm wondering about the long-term success of it because the rents, you know, particularly in my part of town, are so ridiculously high. Well, I guess everybody can say that now. Uh, that how are we keeping them housed when the area? What's the long term? Yeah. Um, uh, and um, I, a question about the problem solving with municipal and elected mm -hmm. staff. I've heard this pitched, and I'm still really unclear on what this is. Um, all the time, I find people who they're they're. You're not high enough acuity to qualify for stuff, or even though they might be high acuity enough, they're not entered into CES. And are, are we talking about municipal and elected staff, like my field reps, entering people into CES? No. No, it's, no. So it's basically to provide assistance to build relationships and rapport with people to determine if there are alternate um, options for housing outside of CES. Because there are sometimes different, different opportunities for people um, that might be relocating with families and talking with their friends. Um, again, we could, that would be another, like we could give you a whole program overview of problem solving if that yeah, would be I, helpful. I, I'm, I'm curious what that is. Yeah. I've, I've been told that you know, there's some potential funding that people yep. can use for stuff and I, I worry about how that gets spent wisely. But I also wonder if, if in addition to municipal and elected staff that uh, we, we might want to be, if that's the model, doing that for people like CELA who are out there actually doing the work on the ground. Yeah, I think the thing that was interesting to me about this one, because I've seen this presentation a couple times now, on the um, problem solving for municipal and elected staff, that also being basically getting the training on doing that assessment and building rapport so that those staff can actually access a, a shared pool of funding to make available to the folks that they're talking to immediately on the, on the spot as opposed to having to connect them with a service provider, staff, or something like that who does have access to that pool of funding. I think that gives you, and I mean, I don't know if there are plans for other types of organizations like that, but it, gives, it would give staff in your field office, for example, who may have a direct contact with somebody who really does need the types of stuff that that pool of funding is for, access to that funding to be able to actually directly assist the person on the spot. Is this something like when someone comes in at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon and they desperately need a motel voucher, but there's, there's no money, no agency available to give it to them until Monday, they'd be able to get a motel voucher? Not necessarily. It would depend. It would have to be like a plan for them to go into housing for like staying with a family member. But, or the examples I've heard are things like that, like transportation or they're staying with a family member, but the family member can only take them in if they, there's no furniture for them or something like that to be able to actually bounce people, those smaller one-time incidental costs that can, um, if provided when the person is sitting in front of you, could get them into a, a permanent, yeah, a permanent, um, placement, sort of the but for one-time costs that might be um, otherwise keep somebody out of a, that type of a solution. I, I get a lot more questions on that that can be saved for another time. My, my last question is um, uh, the uh, system support infrastructure development. Uh, I, I, I hear that or I, I hear that as capacity building for organizations. A lot of them take on more and, and do stuff. Is there a way we can make additional funding incumbent upon uh, improving the, the access that unhoused people have to their services? I mean, I'm constantly talking to people who can't get through to an agency or don't get a call back or they can't. That should make, making it easier from the customer service perspective, I, I think is, is really important. 
So that's part of what the CES refinement and testing actually is, is they're, work, they're creating implementation plan work with the providers to develop what's, see what's go working, what's not. And I mean, customer service should be a part of it that should be discussed, but um, it's also being overseen by the COC board, um, or CES policy, policy council as well. Is the lived experience advisory board part of that? They're on the CES policy council. Okay. Because the, the service provider is not the one who can determine the quality of the customer service. You're correct. Yeah. There are persons with lived experience on the CES Policy Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Harris Dawson. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Bonin, uh, for going to the depths of these uh, policy issues. Uh, you, you know, the line of questioning, which I agree with wholeheartedly, along with, uh, together with, because to me they're married, this idea about acuity and the people with the most acuity getting help first um, reminds me of something, and this is, I understand this is not something that you all can do something about specifically, and I'm not throwing out a specific, but I'm, I'm throwing out a general, and I'm throwing it out on purpose. And I shall never forget, uh, Miguel Santana said this, my first HHA, uh, my first Homeless and Poverty Committee meeting. Part of the problem in our system is the amount of money we spend and time we spend and resources we spend going through a process to prove that a person needs help, right? So, you know, we, we ha I had a case, which is everything that Mr. Bynes has talked about, like all of those are processes to prove that the person is poor enough that we should help them, as opposed to, you know, in other parts of the world, you know, just take the healthcare system, in other parts of the world, you go to the doctor and they say, what hurts? And then they fix it, and then after that, they ask you your name. In the U.S., there are 18 forms, and then they say, okay, if something hurts, maybe we can do something about it. And, and we kind of have set up that system uh, in homelessness. You know, we had a, uh, just a heartbreaking situation. Uh, where our bridge home shelter is, it's in an industrial area. Uh, some of the factories there hire people in the shelter. And in this case, they had hired somebody who didn't live in the shelter. He told them, you know, in place to live. They said, well, go to the shelter. It's right there. We know they have beds. Well, it was 545 on a Friday. 62-year-old male. The staff had to tell him where the encampment was. I mean, that's, you know, we just have a, that's a bizarre system an extremely bizarre system. And so I just think every time that you all have an opportunity to chip away at that, uh, chip away at that, because now we're, you're to the point where it's diminishing returns. You spend more money to keep from helping someone who doesn't need help, you end up spending more than you would if you accidentally helped a few people who didn't need it or didn't deserve it. So or we end up spending more, uh, more money preventing people from getting help than we would if we if a few people slip through the system. And so, you know, I just, again, we're in a crisis, uh, and it's very, very hard when you're in a crisis, but I want to sound the alarm and make sure that flag flies high in the air and that we're all remembering it when we're going through the process. Thank you, Mr. harris -Elson. I mean, I, I, would, I would think, speaking of infrastructure that is lacking, I would think that um, by now we would have a system set up so that the walk-in to our field office for, on a, Friday at 5 p.m., which we've all had, including myself. I mean, we'll give bus passes or drive someone to PATH partners that's in my district. But it's always a what do we do? It's Friday at 5 o'clock. It shouldn't be like that now. And anyone who needs a bed, we should assume they're being sincere because I think it's a real stretch that someone would walk in and be insincere about needing a bed because they were homeless. The assumption should be, yeah, we believe you. How can we help you? Uh, and so if we could build, you know, we're in the, we, we can build this system so that it works. And, um, and we can do that. So I'll have some recommendations um, after we hear from Mr. Rue. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. And, and thank you for um, making sure that LASA comes to all of our meetings to give us updates. And I really want to thank LASA for coming here as well. Um, we don't have direct jurisdiction over you, but it is a joint powers authority and really appreciate you coming and updating us on all the great work that you guys are working on. Um, you know, um, you talked about roommate subsidy. So is that a new thing that you're doing or it's already implemented? So it's new. It hasn't been implemented yet. It's just a potential 
proposal, we would have to put it, bring it out, develop it, bring it to an RFP, and okay. yeah. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, and shallow subsidy, is that be, uh, being impl implemented now? It is being implemented within prevention. Um, so once prevention ends, seniors are eligible to access that resource and it's an additional subsidy that they can utilize up to five years. This would just expand it to all populations. Great. And I really love the shallow subsidy, but can you explain to the audience, uh, people who are listening in, what shallow subsidy is? So it's an additional subsidy that um, individuals or seniors at this point are eligible to access. Um, based on their current financial situation and it's additional dollars that can help support paying rent um, longer for up to five years. So, and it's, and it's designed for people who are just about to fall out and possibly lose, Correct. who can't afford to Correct. make ends meet and uh, they could qualify for the shallow subsidy. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a whole different um, population that we're serving, which, which is great. Um, but you know, I want to piggyback on um, what uh, Councilman Bonin was bringing up, well, what all my colleagues were bringing up, and I really look forward to, and maybe in the next presentation or some future presentation that you can tell us about the acuity levels, um, because I am getting, um, I am hearing from um, various uh, folks that it's only the most acute um, individuals that are uh, being able to qualify for all of these subsidy dollars. And when we talk about subsidy dollars like rapid rehousing, we're talking about um, for existing uh, units, right? Uh, private units. We're, we're not talking about like the homeless housing that we're building. Right. Right. So it would be um, for existing apartment complexes where private owners would sign up for this um, and, and, and take this rapid rehousing dollar and provide housing for uh, individuals experiencing homelessness, mm -hmm. right? So, but then, so I would love to hear about, because I'm told it's only the most acute folks who could qualify. So we would love that breakdown. And I know um, my colleague, Councilman Bonnie, gave you a huge breakdown on all the things that he's asking for. But I would also like to know, if you could answer it now, or if you can't, I'd love to hear it in the report as well, is can you walk us through an actual placement? So if an individual um, gets identified, and let's say it's the most acute person, how do they access the rapid rehousing? Yeah, we would have to put that in the report back. Okay. Yeah. So I would love to see the step-by-step -step process. Yeah. Because um, another concern that I have w along with my colleagues is it's not just the acuity, but it takes on average six months or nine months to actually place someone. I don't know if that's true or not, but I would really love to, because um, if, the, if the unit is remaining vacant mm -hmm. for even a few months, that's just, you know, some, we'd love to see if there's any other way we could house that as soon as possible. And, and we're a little frustrated here because we're sticking our necks out and we're going out in the community trying to build um, housing on our own um, so we can house our unhoused neighbors. But obviously, this is something for existing stock that, um, that we could rapidly re house um, individuals so we could start showing some results. So if we're out there, you know, um, uh, fighting tooth and nail, uh, to build new um, housing. Um, we want to make sure that the, the existing programs are working uh, to its maximum potential. So thank you, and we'd love for, to see that report. Thank you, Mr. Rue. Um, I understand that uh, Wayne Spindler um, has filled out a comment card or would like to have for items one and four, since we haven't voted on them yet. So I think we, we're good with the questions right now. Thank you. And then I'm going to make recommendations after we hear this and before we vote on it. Thank you. Um, items one and items four, uh, one minute for each item. Yes, so we're here again. And again, I appreciate the Honorable Marquisi Dildo Harris Dawson turning his fucking chair and his little head behind so he doesn't face my back of my head because he don't want to hear what the white people on the panel are saying that you can't get a goddamn shower you can't get a goddamn hotel voucher a city of four million people and you got one clown over there in the 8th district, another clown. I think you need to say the items. Items one or I, item four only. We're talking about the showers and batches and the batches and the showers. We're talking about that. And all you can do, 
My quiz is just turn that chair around, lean back that little tiny head of yours, wonder where are we gonna steal the money next from the federal government, or the state government, or the county, we gotta steal more money? And I look at him, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer knows you got to steal more money. And I know the police got to steal more money. And Again, you're straying from items one well, or four. It's about homeless shit. You're completely straying from the items. You have to I'm stick to the items. I'm speaking the homeless and poverty items. Then Spalk mentioned. And I'm saying you don't have any goddamn damn money to fund those items because you got to steal some more money. So let's all get out there. Let's do some more legal bank robbery. And again, I want to thank one of your deputy city attorneys, Jeffrey Plotter. He do a good job of defending the pensions of the LAPD so you can fucking waste more money. Right, thank you, niggas. I want to thank Ms. Andrade and I want to thank um, um, Ms. Barkley for your presentation answering the questions. Appreciate it very much. It was a, a great discussion on item one. So uh, uh, it was just a verbal update uh, only. But I am going to make uh, recommendations for the next update and with bringing some uh, tangible uh, information. One, in terms of placement, um, we are getting, we're, we're months away from HH projects opening every single month. And then several months away from HHH projects opening about every two weeks. We're going to start getting into the hundreds and then the thousands of units opening in the next handful of years. So there, there is an issue with placement, and acuity comes into play because in the hopper, there's no one else waiting for a unit if we're not successful in keeping the person identified for that unit housed. I understand through a conversation I've had with Heidi Marsden that in the strategic planning, that will be addressed in terms of developing a, f a pool of people waiting for a unit so that if there is a unit that becomes available because of, for whatever reason, maybe the person, um, you know, found somewhere else to live or we weren't successful in keeping them housed, that we can rapidly refill that unit. If that process isn't firmly in place really soon, um, we're going to be in a world of hurt and, the, and the people are going to know about it and it will just reek of failure, and so we cannot have that happen. But I think acuity comes into play in that. So another, you, I think you get what I'm saying. So we'd love to have a, a report on how that system is taking shape or has already been built out and is in place. The other one is uh, it also in relation to the strategic planning process. Um, we want to hear uh, information on an after hours intake process. That's really critical and thanks to this conversation I hadn't really thought about how we need specific we need to specifically develop that system that everyone has, has access to. Whether it's in the middle of the night on a on a Sunday morning at 2 a.m. or whatever wherever it may be and when we're leave, leaving our council offices in the, in the early evening there needs to be a central intake process available to everyone 24-7. That has to be in place. And if there is one in place or a, um, a version of that that's in place, then we need to know about it and we need to know how, how it works. And if, if we don't have one, we need to develop one really fast. Um, and then lastly, instruct LASA to come back with tangible goals, performance goals, slash performance goals, goals including specifics on all programming, including rapid rehousing. Um, so the categories in the presentation you made, um, specific to tangible goals. Um, and it really does all feed into the larger, feed into the larger goal of reducing homelessness. Um, and that's where I would like this conversation to start moving to really quickly as we begin housing people by the hundreds in the coming months. I think that'll be really important. Mr. Rudy, did you have something to add? Yeah, Mr. Chair, if you could just add the pro asking for the protocol for the rapid rehousing, if they could just. That was, no, yeah, yeah that was kind of, that was yeah. in the first uh, piece. Uh, well, the rapid rehousing in terms of a unit when it becomes available. Yes. 
that, that was in the first instruction I mentioned. But, but you know, rapid rehousing in terms of temporary shelter is also important, uh, and you can report on that as well. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, um, again, no action necessary, but we do look forward to the next update with those specifics. Thank you. Thanks again. Uh, and that brings us to item number four, Mr. Reef. Item number four, Housing Community Investment Department of Los Angeles report relative to programs that provide assistance to seniors and the feasibility of creating a pilot program in the city. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here. And uh, we have uh, aging and H sit up, so please uh, identify and, and uh, go through your report. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Matthew Sharp, Housing Community Investment Department. James Don, Assistant General Manager, Department of Aging. We are here to provide you a very concise summary of what we've learned to date in response to your request that we look into the Santa Monica program called Preserving Our Diversity, which aims to prevent seniors from falling into homelessness, and more importantly, to answer any questions you have regarding potential program design and a funding allocation. Mm -hmm. In your packet for today's agenda, you have the transmittal submitted by our general manager, Rushmore Cervantes, outlining eight pages of content at uh, your disposal. Happy to provide you a concise summary of that and or answer any questions you may have. Okay. And Mr. Orring, anything to add? Um, if I can steal some Please. Uh, the yeah. presentation time. Um, I just wanted to start commenting about that there are two really big areas of challenges for seniors, especially seniors at risk of homelessness, Ec economic insecurity and health issues. So in terms of economic insecurity, the California uh, Elder Index states that in the city of LA, in order to meet the basic needs of a senior, um, the annual income should be 24,640. Uh, but the problem is the average Social Security benefit is only 16,092. There's a huge a gap year. right yeah, there. For a year. Um, the estimate, it's estimated that there are about a quarter million seniors in LA County who are on the edge of homelessness just based on their income and the cost of rent. And of that quarter million, 238,000 are already spending 50% or more of their income on housing. Um, and it's understandable considering that the economy had uh, recently undergone a period of recession that about 28% of older adults have n no retirement savings, I mean, in order to, to make it through the, this period. Now, the other half of the challenge, the, the healthcare issues, 85% of older adults have at least one chronic condition. 73% uh, have two on average. Uh, the average out-of-pocket health cost, that's after Medicare and Medicare covers everything else, is $4,734. Again, year. going back to the $16,092. And so that 4000 plus is, it, is per year of health care? Yes, out-of-pocket out of pocket costs. 30% yeah. mm -hmm. um, of the emergency room visits by the homeless are actually older adult homeless. And older adult homeless have a four times greater mortality rate than the general homeless population. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, are the challenges which really makes uh, this motion about looking into additional support for homeless senior, mm -hmm. I think is, is so critical at this timing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to take the opportunity to, to thank the council. I mean, for the last plus 10 years, uh, we've always gotten support for our meals program so that there are no waiting lists. Mm -hmm. uh, for the last couple of years, the council has also supported our older employment workers program to help uh, homeless seniors and at-risk homeless uh, seniors uh, get job training, stabilize their income, and, and hopefully get into housing. And I also want to put a plug in for uh, our budget package for the 2021 fiscal year includes a request to fund a homeless uh, services center. Mm -hmm. uh, the location will be at the George and Helen Thomas Center in the West Adams area, but it will provide citywide services to uh, seniors who are homeless. And with that, I'll turn it back to over to Great. Matthew. Uh, Mr. Sharp, would you like to elaborate a little bit on your findings so far? Certainly. Appreciate the opportunity and uh, appreciate the overview of the context that we're working in from Assistant General Manager Dunn from 
Department of Aging, a few key findings that we've presented to you in writing here. One is that the city of Santa Monica considered the diversity that seniors present in their community such an important value that they've redirected housing construction funds to a shallow subsidy program akin to the previous presentation from Ms. Andrade of LASA to enable seniors of low income to retain their housing. That's an important component of Santa Monica's effort to preserve their diversity. Uh, we've looked closely at a number of programs throughout the county that are described there. A number of county department programs are underway in various shapes and forms, as well as several small municipalities have also mm -hmm. undertaken similar efforts. This is occurring at a time of great investment here in the city in attempting to prevent homelessness. And it, it is uh, our strongest hope that the council will provide direction and funding to facilitate a senior-specific program, perhaps anchored at the new uh, senior homeless prevention facility in West Adams we just heard about, or perhaps at the multi-purpose centers throughout the city to better assist seniors in addressing the different challenges. Regarding your previous range of questions on what are prevention funds, what is the flex fund, what is that being used for, as Mr. Bonin was attempting to determine, is that motel vouchers, is that subsidy for utility bill, how does the prevention work? We're in the process of implementing a series of prevention programs at the Family Source Centers and a larger citywide effort uh, to uh, prevent evictions. All of these things stitched together, if adequately resourced, should provide a series of opportunities for case managers in different settings to plug in different resources to respond to the specific challenges. Some of the challenges that Santa Monica told us they're most frequently facing are folks who have rent in arrears. They need to pay several months back rent due to some outstanding either medical expense or change in family dynamics. Those are one-time payments. There are also ongoing expenses that we need to work together to better identify the resources to help meet the needs of. So our primary recommendations are for you all to have a formal report back from Department of Aging Ooh. outlining the, the structure of this particular uh, program and how it could be implemented across the city at the resource levels that may be made available. And for uh, the CLA and CAO to come forward with some potential funding sources that could be used to get this going, perhaps within this fiscal year as well as part of the 20. 21 fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, for us at the Housing Community Investment Department to look into further what are the applicable rent assistance programs that could be scaled up uh, across the city to specifically meet the needs of this population at this time. Matthew, if I, if I may also add, um, mm -hmm. so I just wanted to share with the committee kind of the, the thinking that our department is uh, you know, looking at this issue. Depending on the scale, I mean, the level of funding that would be available, we would scale up the program. So for the last couple of years, we've uh, had an emergency assistance program, um, very small funded from foundations, about $10,000 per year. And basically what we do is we use that for micro, um, micro grants just to, to help seniors avoid uh, becoming evicted or w whatever else the need may be. Mm -hmm. So for that particular program, it's a $500 per person maximum per year. There's a very specific reason why it's fi limited to 500. It's because of tax implications. Mm -hmm. um, there's also additional concerns about uh, not creating any problems with their current benefits. If, if they receive too many assets, we're worried that they'll lose their SSI or whatever else it is. We were really happy to hear about the fact that Santa Monica had worked out an agreement with their Social Security office so that whatever uh, cash assistance they were getting wasn't going to count against their benefits. But there's still an issue about taxes and, and the requirement to issue tax forms. And excuse me, but what's this program called? Uh, we, we call it LEAP, uh, the, the LADOA Emergency Assistance Program. Emergency Assistance Program. Yeah, and the way it works basically is our network of uh, senior multipurpose centers, the case managers there, uh, they forward to us applications on behalf of seniors for whatever it is that they may need. Uh, we, we have our coordinator review it, approve it, and instead of having to go through the whole you know, city process of sending out payments through the city controller's office. We actually set up a separate outside checking account where we write the check directly to the
the agency, and then they take care of whatever the vendor payment. So we could get, generate a check within 24, 48 hours at the, at the most. Mm, okay. uh, and it and works really sorry, well. That's up to $500 per year? Per person. Per person, and you, your total budget's ten thousand dollars. Yeah, it's whatever we can get yeah. from from, from, uh, from our foundation grant. But but to your thinking, when you saw this motion, this initiative, uh, could you scale that up and and uh, modify the system, uh, especially once you, and maybe you already know, but once you have a strong sense of the Santa Monica model. Yeah, uh, it, if we were to scale up something really large, where we're our, our, our program is really focused on diversion, mm -hmm. you know. Um, just to give it a, a really quick example, Laura, our, our general manager, was just sharing with me just a couple of days ago. She wrote a, a check for about $400 for a senior because sh she has to have insulin, and her refrigerator, her used refrigerator, uh, broke down, and she, she needed to buy a new one. Now, her rent is $900 a month. She only gets nine hundred and forty dollars per month, mm -hmm. so we're not. We're wondering how she's surviving on yeah. forty dollars, and then she has to buy a new refrigerator in order to keep her insulin, you know, effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's those things where we feel like, you know, this one-time payment is going to keep the senior housed, and it's the most cost-effective way to approach it. So if we scale up to San Monica's level, we do need more research to see how they're handling the tax issue. Mm -hmm. We will need some staff within our own department to handle all the requirements of tax forms and so forth. But most of the money would go directly towards helping the seniors directly as well as staffing at our multipurpose centers. Because we, we had a meeting with our case managers uh, just about a week ago, and they all basically said that they're getting overwhelmed with requests for services. Mm -hmm. So we can only burden them so much further. We really need additional social workers out there at our community partners. So whatever amount of funding our de program design is coming back to you would include a request for additional social workers out at our multipurpose centers, uh, some basic core staff, uh, within the department to, to ensure our, our fiduciary responsibility with those funds. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the biggest part of the fund will be the cash assistance that goes out to the seniors. Okay, great. Uh, colleagues, any questions? So, um, the, you also include the, you know, the disability community as well uh, in this, in the senior population. and. Are there any other populations that you feel need to be addressed in this? I mean, the focus is seniors here. Um, maybe that's a, separate, that's a separate topic for a separate time. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is uh, we'll continue the item, but we'll instruct the CLA, along with the Department of Aging and any other related departments, um, to report on steps needed to create a pilot program to provide rental and cash assistance to seniors at risk of becoming homeless. Uh, and also report back on the related issues that you brought up, the tax issues, um, other issues, and how it could be scaled uh, up to a Santa Monica model. But uh, also, if you could um, take a look at the impending explosion of the senior population. I'm at the very tail end of the baby boom, and I was born in one of the, the highest population birth years, and um, we know that we're going to experience a senior population boom as never before in world history, and we're going to need to be prepared at all levels of government. And so if, if Department of Aging could just look at census data uh, and cross-reference it with Los Angeles data, et cetera, et cetera, and give us an indication of where we're going to be with this population in one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, ten years. Um, because this could be, uh, you know, a, one agenda item of a homelessness and poverty committee on, you know, February 5th, or the, that's the day today, that uh, has incredible implications, I'm thinking. Especially when you talk about 250,000 seniors right now who are extremely rent burdened. Um, I, th I think that we could be headed to a real sort of um, uh, catastrophe, if, if you will, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the straits that some of these seniors are going to be in in Los Angeles. 
which I think is why it's so important to have a sense of urgency about this motion and the implications. So we look forward to um, um, a report on, uh, on this pilot program and all of the implications that we've uh, talked about today. Um, and so uh, without uh, objection, that'll be the order. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I think that we uh, have heard the last item, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.